Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. It's a great pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, share our experience with Exxon Array Platform, which is a newly available array platform from uh, Thermo Fisher, and to share how we plan to use this platform to overcome the challenge of detecting partial gene deletions and duplications to complement our clinical exome uh, sequencing and focused exome analysis. So we all know that uh, partial gene deletions and duplications represent a very important mutation type uh, causing Mendelian disorders. And this recent study from uh, Invita uh, serves as an excellent reminder just how common partial gene deletions and duplications are as a cause of Mendelian disorders. So in this study, they looked at more than 140,000 cases that were tested uh, by Invita using different NGS panels, and all their assays also include copy number deletion, du copy number analysis, deletion duplication analysis. And they were able to show that in, the, in this entire cohort, almost 2% of the cases had clinically significant, uh, significant deletions and duplications in tested genes. And then when you look at positive cases, almost 10% of all the positive cases were positive because there was a pathogenic deletion or duplication, and that ranged anywhere between uh, almost 5% to 35%. And they also uh, broke the cohort uh, depending on what was the reason of referral. And it turns out that with uh, some, um, some types of diseases, copy number abnormalities in tested genes were a very significant uh, disease cause. So if you look at neurological disorders, or if you look at cancer predisposition um, the, the, uh, the, uh, diseases, uh, there is a very high proportion of those cases that were positive because there was a partial gene deletion or duplication as the cause. And also when you look at different genes, there are genes that are known to be very commonly affected by intragenic deletions and duplications. I mean, and we, uh, we all know what those genes are, SMN1, PMP2, uh, PMP22, DMD gene, NF1, and many others. Yeah, so the summary from this and conclusion take home message is that if you're doing testing for Mendelian disorder, disorders, you should probably always be doing partial gene deletion and duplication testing. But there are some indications where it's um, uh, unimaginable to do um, testing for those specific uh, referring diagnoses um, without incorporating uh, deletion duplication testing because you will be just missing too many positive cases. And that includes neuro neurodevelopmental disorders and cancer cancer predisposition. And our laboratory was very interested in offering genetic testing in those areas. And so we were struggling how to come up with effective way um, to incorporate partial gene deletion and duplication testing into our, um, into our testing, into our workflow. Now, there are very uh, well-established traditional methods that will allow you to test for copy number abnormalities, including real-time PCR, MLPA, droplet digital PCR. But all those are very uh, uh, convenient for single gene testing. Uh, but it, uh, are low throughput and they're not comprehensive if you want to do a large panels or uh, scale it up to exome. And also most of them are custom designs um, and when you're working in a clinical laboratory that brings up all kinds of issues related to optimization and quality control and validation. Uh, many laboratories are going uh, the route of designing custom arrays for, for partial gene deletion duplication testing for the genes that they are testing for. Uh, however, we are in the era where a discovery of new medically important genes happens very rapidly. Uh, so uh, that means that if you are offering a panel that has preset uh, genes, uh, then you would have to uh, update those panels very frequently. And that's why more and more laboratories are moving towards doing um, exome-based analysis. Um, so on exome backbone, you are just doing focused analysis of genes of interest. And so this is the route that our laboratory decided to, um, that, that our laboratory decided to take. And that way we can very easily update what genes we are analyzing informatically you know, as new genes get discovered. Uh, but then if you try to complement that with custom array, uh, which is difficult to update, and then it beats the purpose of using focused exome if you have a part, a part of that assay that is very difficult to update, which would be this custom array for partial genes deletions and duplications. And finally, um, there is more and more use of informatics, to, uh, informatics tools to the, the test for copy number abnormalities from NGS data. 
Um, so our, uh, our group is definitely looking into that approach as well. Um, however, uh, there is still, uh, that's still uh, very challenging, especially from exome data, and there is still too high false positive and false negative rate. So this can definitely not be used as a standalone in clinical testing. You definitely need, it, need to um, complement that with some um, uh, robust uh, confirmatory assay. Uh, now, it has already been shown that you can design a, a genome, whole genome-wide uh, exon resolution array. And uh, this is a, one example, one publication um, that uh, describes this approach from GeneDx. Uh, so they custom designed an array that had coverage for every exon in the entire uh, genome. And, but, um, and they show that this, uh, this has great utility to complement their clinical exome and their different NGS panels. Uh, but designing custom uh, array like this is definitely not an easy task. So if you're a cl clinical laboratory that's very busy, and this is a very uh, substantial challenge to do on your own. And that's why we were very excited where this exact platform uh, became available from uh, Thermo Fisher um, as a custom, uh, as a uh, commercially available um, product. So we, we were uh, very interested in testing it as quickly as it became available. And just to introduce the platform briefly, uh, so this is, as I already mentioned, exon resolution um, array for all the genes in the genome, practically. Uh, so it covers uh, more than 20, uh, 25,000 genes. Um, and it has um, more than 6.8 million, million probes. Most of them are copy number probes, uh, but there are also SNP probes if you're also interested in detecting AOH or loss of heterozygosity, so absence or loss of heterozygosity. Uh, and what I, we think is really um, uh, great about the platform is that all the probes that are utilized um, are empirically selected to have a good performance. Um, so in the design, uh, they started with a, a much larger pool of probes, and they empirically tested their performance and uh, selected those that had the best performance in detecting copy number changes. And I think that this very careful approach to the design uh, allows very, for very good performance uh, so, they, uh, so that it, it showed, mm, this, uh, this platform showed 95% sensitivity when it was tested um, in-house for detecting very small um, copy number abnormalities. Um, so the genes that are represented on the array are divided based on their, their level of clinical significance, and, and their coverage is adjusted accordingly. So there are so-called tier one genes uh, of higher import, highest importance clinically. Those are clearly associated, associated with Mendelian disorders. And for those genes, there is a much higher level of coverage so that not, there are not only multiple uh, intra-exotic probes, but there is also probes um, in flanking regions around the exons. And then there is the tier two genes, um, includes additional clinivar genes, uh, but with less clear disease association. Uh, tier three um, adds additional omim genes, and the lowest tier are the genes that are protein coding, but that do not have at this time clear association with Mendelian diseases. Uh, what we also really liked um, uh, about this platform is that it's very easy to add it as additional platform and incorporate it into our current workflow because we already use Cytoscan HD and other platforms from Thermo Fisher, and, and this does not require any additional equipment, and it also does not need, require any additional analysis tool, um, so you can use CHAS for analysis. And we also like that it allows focused analysis on just the, the genes you are interested in. Um, so you do not have to look at all the genes. You can um, select um, only the genes that you are looking at in your focused exome assay, for example, uh, or you can select to only look at tier one genes. And so you do not have to worry uh, about incidental findings if you do not want to um, deal with them. So as I said, we were very excited to test it out and to validate, uh, validate the platform in our laboratory. And so we prepared um, a, a large set of uh, positive samples, samples that had known previously detected very small deletions and duplications uh, to test uh, this platform and to see what will be the sensitivity ability to detect those previously known, um, known uh, deletions and duplications. And those were detected by the variety of assays, real-time PCR, MLPA, and, and they were specifically selected cases to be very challenging to be just exon, you know, one or two exon deletions and duplications. 
And we were very pleased to see that in all the cases, um, previously known abnormalities were detected. There were two cases where um, it required manual review, and all the other cases were detected by CHES. In these two challenging cases, one was mosaic deletion uh, within SMARC-B1 gene, um, and the second one was in PMS2 gene, which has pseudogenes, and it's uh, very well known to be a very challenging gene, both for SNB detection and for copy number detection. And so we were very, uh, 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 very um, uh, excited about the sensitivity that this platform showed in our, during our validation. Now, we were also worried uh, uh, about um, what we call specificity or false positive, positive uh, calls, possibly false positive. So will we be able to interpret or exclude, eliminate all the other calls um, that we might be seeing? Uh, because if you look at all the cover genes on this array um, in our tested cases, there were about 160 calls uh, um, on average um, in our validation cases. Now, that seems like a lot, but when we compare that with the number of calls that we get from our um, NGS copy number analysis, and this is actually a very modest number. And then if you only focus on level one genes, that number drops to about 60. And then if you uh, further down, um, if, uh, further um, focus on your primary genes based on the patient's phenotype, then you only have 10 to 15 calls, which is a, a completely manageable number. But still, even with that relatively small number of probes, uh, calls, copy number calls, we wanted to make sure that we will be able to interpret them if these were real clinical cases. Uh, so um, out of the 32 validation cases, um, three didn't quite pass QC. So for the specificity analysis, we uh, took 29 cases. Uh, we looked at all the calls in uh, tier one genes, uh, tier one um, uh, genes, the genes in the, the highest tier, and we um, asked ourselves, can we interpret them and can we um, exclude them as possibly pathogenic calls? So we had, um, for comparison, we had control samples that were run using the same platform. Those are now available. So there's a database of common exon calls that's available uh, from Thermo Fisher. Uh, we were using DGV, and we also looked at the nature of the gene itself. And it turns out that all the calls could be explained either because there are common calls in exon database, exon array specific database, or in DGV, or they were in recessive genes, so at the most they would have been uh, consistent with carrier status. Uh, there were only two cases where we had copy number calls in dominant genes, but then in the real time, in real case analysis, you would also have patient phenotype. So you could probably be able to correlate with the phenotype and, and, and that would help you further in interpretation. So we were very happy at the end of our validation with both sensitivity and specificity that, that, this, um, that this platform showed. And, and we were really um, uh, ready and confident that we can um, use this clinically and incorporate in our workflow. Okay, so uh, five more minutes just to cover what we, what we have done after our validation. This is just showing some really challenging cases um, and how nicely uh, copy number abnormalities were detected. Uh, so then in, uh, when we asked the question how to incorporate this into our workflow, um, it seemed like it will be too much expense and too much addition to our workflow if we did this on every single negative focused exome or exome case. And so what we decided to do is to combine this with our NGS copy number calling. And since I said that our, um, our uh, informatics team is, is developing their own algorithm, uh, but what we um, know is that they have a very large number of copy number calls, and it's not very specific because it's still very challenging to, um, to do copy number calling from exome data. Uh, so it's literally in hundreds of, of calls uh, when you look at your primary gene list. Uh, so we were thinking that we could use the NGS copy number calling as the initial screen, and then um, if we have uh, very promising candidates uh, for deletions and duplications, uh, use cytoscan array for confirmation and really focus on overlapping call between an uh, NGS algorithm and a cytoscan um, assay. Uh, so this is a case where we try to do exactly that. Uh, we had 80 calls from copy number algorithms from NGS data, uh, 38 in tier one genes um, in, uh, from exon array, and 12 overlapping calls. And when we manually expected these calls, we were confident that all, these were all real positive calls, that these are um, not any artifacts, those are really biologically uh, real phenomena, and this is just one of those overlapping calls. 
So how are we now moving towards implementing this as a part of our workflow and in the lab? And so I would just give example of one of our focused exomes that is already clinically offered, and this is validated and clinically offered, and we are now just adding copy number component using this combination of NGS, CNV analysis, and exon array. So this is our ocular disease-focused um, exome, and it is an exome backbone, uh, but analysis only focuses on 259 genes, which are associated with eye anomalies and retinal degeneration. Um, and it's a very exciting assay because it has very high diagnostic yield. This, this is the results from our 36 uh, uh, first uh, tested cases. Uh, and in more than two-thirds of the cases, uh, we have positive results. Uh, and by the way, this is all done by my colleague, uh, Ryan Schmidt, so I want to give him credit uh, for, uh, for the slides and for the, the results. Uh, so um, in more than two-thirds of the cases are positive just by sequencing only. And these are the genes where positive findings were, uh, were the detected in the first initial cases. Uh, but um, these uh, uh, genes and um, this group of diseases are already known as uh, diseases where you have very high incidence of copy number abnormalities. So it has been shown uh, that a large proportion of cases that don't have sequenced abnormalities do have copy number as a cause of a disease. So definitely focused exome assay that, that needs to be complemented with copy number. And indeed, in those first 36 cases, we already had two cases uh, where it was highly suspicious that, it would be, uh, that they will have copy number problem. Uh, both were mutations in recessive genes. In one gene, there was only one mutation detected, and, and it was known pathogenic, but in the recessive, uh, recessive genes, so we suspected there is probably a second hit, and that could have been a deletion. And the second case looked, uh, looked like a homozygous mutation, but again, we suspected that it's a mutation in one allele and deletion in the other. So we applied our approach that we will look first from NGS data, um, uh, for copy number from NGS data. And in both cases, it really looked based on NGS data analysis that, that there should be deletions in this gene. And in one case, it looked like there was a two, um, two exon deletion, and these are log two ratios, and the second case, six exon deletion. Um, and then um, to just jump straight to the confirmation of these suspected deletions from exon array, here it's showing how both deletions were very nicely um, confirmed. Um, so to summarize our experience today, um, we uh, believe that this will be an excellent adjunct tool uh, for our clinical exomes and our focused exomes. It's very simple to use and has same software and workflow uh, with our Cytoscan HD and other Thermo Fisher arrays. It has very flexible analysis, so we can focus analysis only to the genes of interest and avoid incidental findings. It requires uh, low DNA input, it's at reasonable cost, um, and it has a much lower number of calls than our NGS um, copy number algorithms. So in all our negative uh, exome cases and focused exome cases, we will apply this approach for copy number detection and, as, and also for all recessive genes where we only see one mutation. So with that, I want to th thank all my colleagues at um, uh, Center for Personalized Medicine at CHLA, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you.